Welcome to the first of our three diversity and inclusion workshops. I'm Cindy Goldstein. I'm the director of the Dale Friedman Institute for Professional Development. I'm so glad to see all of you. Nice to see some new faces. I'm just going to give a brief introduction, put this into a Jewish context, and then Lara Nicholson is going to introduce our speaker for this morning. Equality, justice, and Jewish values. In the Torah, Jews are taught to accept others without prejudice or bias. The Torah states, you shall not hate your kinsfolk in your heart. Reprove your kinsmen, but incur no guilt because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against your countrymen. Love your fellow as yourself. In the Talmud, we learn that all people are descendants from a single person, so that no person can say, quote, my ancestor is greater than yours. God created humanity from the four corners of the earth, yellow clay and white sand, black loam and red soil. Therefore, the earth can declare to no part of humanity that it does not belong here, that the soil is not their rightful home. Judaism also teaches the importance of working with others in the community to achieve social justice. We are taught that in a city where there are both Jews and Gentiles, the collectors of alms collect from both Jews and Gentiles. They feed the poor of both, visit the sick of both, bury both, and restore the lost goods of both for the sake of peace. We all have implicit bias, the topic of today's session, but we have a good model in our humblest of teachers, Moses. There is a moment in Torah where the priest Korach and his supporters rise up to challenge Moses. Who are you to place yourself above everyone else? Didn't God say we are all holy? Now those are fighting words, but Moses' response is instructive. He doesn't shout back. He doesn't yet call down the wrath of God. Instead, Moses falls on his face, literally down on the ground. The rabbis write that Moses casts himself down, not to buy time or plead for help, but to examine, to seek to know and understand himself. Was there truth in Korach's accusation? Was Moshe guilty of arrogance or lust for power? Even Moses needed to ask the hard questions, to scrutinize himself, to be sure of his motives before he could respond. Beliefs and attitudes that we're unaware of can affect us and our relationships with others in unexpected ways. Implicit biases are outside of our awareness. They are not the same as thoughts and feelings we know we have but wish to hide because they are not socially acceptable. Implicit biases may even contradict values and beliefs that we hold strongly. So DFI is pleased to be presenting year two of our collective work on diversity and inclusion funded by the Blaustein Fund for the Enrichment of Jewish Education. Last year, many of you participated in a cohort learning how to engage segments of the Jewish population who are traditionally marginalized. JPRO Day last year and a spring event focused on identities and stories of those in our community. This year, in addition to creating an online toolkit of resources, stay tuned, we are presenting these three workshops, raising awareness and celebrating the fact that diversity is the one thing we all have in common. Today's session is focusing on the personal understanding of our biases. The next session on April 9th with Sherry Brown and Larry Bell from the National Coalition Building Institute will focus on leadership as we understand the role identities play within our organizations. So Lara Nicholson, our uh, DFI board member and member of our curriculum committee and co-chair of our diversity programs will introduce Cherie Wilson. Hi everyone, thank you for coming today. And good morning to Cherie Wilson, thank you for being here. Um, I was very excited when I read Cherie's bio, it's very diverse and there's a lot we can learn from her. Um, you know, we have one topic today, but we hope you'd come back. Um, so our guest today, Cherie Wilson, is a nationally recognized diversity and inclusion, cultural and linguistic competence and health equity subject matter expert. So lots to learn. Most recently, um, she was the director of the corporate office of diversity and inclusion at RJ, um, RWJ Barnabas Health. Um, in New Jersey. Previously, Ms. Wilson was an assistant scientist in the John, Johns Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solutions um, and an acting assistant director of the Quality Improvement Department at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. 
So very interesting background and um, studies. Ms. Wilson received a BA in Russian from Howard University, an MA in Russian Area Studies from the University of Minnesota, was a PhD um, ABED candidate in Russian History um, at the University of Minnesota, and received an MHS in Health Finance and Management from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. So, needless to say, she's multilingual, going to speak English today, but she's fluent in Russian, French, and Spanish with a reading knowledge of German. So welcome, we're very honored to have you here. I had the pleasure of, gosh, that was three months ago, Cindy, um, for the Associated, on the Friday before Martin Luther King Day, there was a workshop, and so part of that, that talk, I um, was the speaker for that, so I'm pleased to be here. Today we're gonna talk about diversity and inclusion. This can be very difficult work, so I always like to start with trying to touch our hearts, because this is heart work, is what some of my colleagues had said, because eventually, if we can touch our hearts, we'll eventually be able to change our own minds. And I love this series, Cindy, because in this session, we're gonna be talking more so about how this affects us personally, but it's gonna be very linked to your next sessions about how this works organizationally and then communally. A little bit of this will be about diversity and inclusion. I tend to be very intersectional, so not just race and ethnicity, not just sexual orientation, not just class, but how these all intersect with one another. I wanted to start off with some ground rules for today's workshop. First, confidentiality. You've all heard that statement, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Kind of what happens in the JCC boardroom stays here. Next is we want to learn from each other. And for me, even as the presenter, that goes both ways. I leave every session I do learning something new and thinking, oh, I should incorporate that into my next workshop. So it goes both ways. I always like to emphasize we will not demean, devalue, or put down people for their experiences, lack of experiences, or difference in interpretation of those experiences. And we'll be talking a little bit later about micro invalidations, and that's kind of where that comes into play. That's talking about, well, because I haven't experienced that, that can't possibly have happened. So we want to keep that in mind. We want to trust that people are always doing the best they can. So think the best of people. When you want to challenge something, please try to challenge the idea, not the person, because we don't want to have personal attacks using more I statements versus you statements. Speak your discomfort. And what I mean by that is I always have, you know, I'm looking around, looking at body language, and I'll see someone where it looks like there's a burning thought. There's something they want to say, but they're holding back. Or they'll come up to me during the break or afterwards, and I'm like, why didn't you share that to the broader group? I'm sure someone had a very similar thought. We could have learned from that. So speak your discomfort. Or if someone says something that doesn't quite sit right with you, please, please speak up. And then the next one is step up and step back. Because we know there are some of us who love to talk a lot and we engage a lot, but we want to make space for all voices in this room. The objectives of today's presentation are, following today's presentation, you will be able to define what, is, what do we mean by cultural competency, diversity, inclusion, as well as culture. And then we will identify how implicit bias works in our everyday lives, with our own families, in our youth work, elder care, community building, fundraising, and media. We will recognize microaggressions, microassaults, microinsults, and microinvalidations. And I like to say it's great to talk about this, but don't you want to go home with what can I actually do about these things? So probably the most important part is when we practice, and this is where we will apply takeaway tips and debiasing techniques for mitigate, mitigating implicit bias. I use a lot of video clips throughout my presentations because sometimes videos can tell a story that I cannot. I also use some international examples too because as Americans, we do not have a monopoly on implicit bias. So I like to start with this one. Hi there. Hi. Nice day, huh? Yeah, finally, right? Where are you from? Your English is perfect. San Diego. We speak English there. Oh, uh, no. Uh, <clears throat> where are you from? Well, I was born in Orange County, but I never actually lived there. I, uh, I mean before that. Before I was born. Yeah, like, well, uh, where are your people from? Well, my great-grandma was from Seoul. Korean. I knew it. I was like, she's either Japanese or Korean. But I was leaning more towards Korean. Amazing. Yeah. Ham Shasina. There's a really good teriyaki barbecue place near my apartment. So I actually really like kimchi. Cool. What about you? Where are you from? San Francisco. But where are you from? Oh, I'm, I'm just American. 
Really? You're Native American? No, uh, just regular American. Oh, well, uh, I guess my grandparents are from England. Oh, well... Hello, Gamda! What's all this then? Top of the morning to you. Let's get a small tea, small tea! Double, double, toil and trouble! Mind the gap! Beware, Jack the Ripper! Bloody hell! Pip, pip! Cheerio! I think your people's fish and chips are amazing. You're weird. Really? I'm weird? Must be a crane thing. Has anyone ever been in that situation? Right? We're all, as humans, we are all naturally curious. There's got to be a better way to ask where people are from, what are your origins, right? Because otherwise, what you're doing is making someone seem like a foreigner in their own land. For all we know, her people could have been here longer than his people were, right? And he's assuming, right, they were, right? Absolutely. But, you know, that can be a very, very loaded question. So I actually wanted to start off with a name exercise. We're a relatively small group. We're going to break into pairs. And in pairs or small groups, I'll demonstrate first, but you're going to discuss your name for a few minutes. So you're going to talk about one who named you, for whom are you named, what does your name mean, what has been your experience with your name, and is there anything else you'd like to share about your name? So I'll start just to demonstrate. I was named by my mother. I was named for my mom's best friend in junior high school. They had a pact, this little junior high teenage pact, that if they had daughters, they would name their daughters for one another. So my mom's best friend in junior high was Cherie Charmaine. Well, Cherie Charmaine never had a daughter, so she wasn't able to hold up that end of the bargain, but I am named for Cherie Charmaine. Uh, my name means, it's actually French, it's Cherie in French. It's, I unfortunately have the incorrect spelling. I should have the feminine spelling with an E on the end. For anyone who speaks French, I have the masculine spelling. It means dear or darling. What's been the experience with my name? Lots of teasing, you know, my Sharia more. In, I'm a 70s and 80s kid, so Shari don't like it. Think of every, you know, oh, Sherry, you know, being mispronounced all the time. Is your name Sherry, Charlotte, this, that? I don't bother most of the time, you know, unless someone's introducing me, I might correct them, but I answer to Sherry, so. That's been my experience with my name. So if we could take about five minutes and, you know, pair share. So one person share this about your name, and then the other person share. Are there one or two brave souls who would like to share what the experience was like? Minda and I are complete opposites. I have the most common name of 1973, the year I was born, and she has a name that she has never met another one of. And yet there were similarities between us about our experience and growing into our names and what we know about it and how we were named. So though there was vast difference, there also felt uh, to be a lot of similarities. My name is Devira. And most people call me Deborah. There's not even a B in my name. Um, it, it is incredible because when I was a little girl, I couldn't even spell it till like the second grade. <laughs> but now that I'm growing older, I appreciate it a little more. And I was named after my grandfather, David, and my mother heard this name. And there aren't very many. I found, though, I've not lived in Baltimore forever. I'm almost a newcomer, but I never found another Devira until I moved to Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Spelled differently, but she pronounces it the same. Let's touch a little bit upon cultural competence, diversity, and culture. So I mentioned at the beginning I'm very intersectional, so it's because of all of the cultural groups to which we belong. And Cindy, I believe you sent out the question, right? What experiences have you had? Think of the cultural groups to which you belong. We tend to think only, well, it's where I was born. Well, it's a combination of things. What's your race? What's your ethnicity? What's your religion? Are you college educated? What's your your socioeconomic status, what's your sexual orientation, your gender, as I look around the room <laughs> and see that we don't have much gender equity, as an example, right? That's a component of diversity. What's your gender identity? Were you born in the United States? Is English your first language? There are so many components of who we are. What do we mean by cultural competence? I like to refer to this as lifelong learning. It's a developmental process and it evolves over an extended period of time. So even though I do this work professionally, I am constantly learning. Uh, there is a webinar I'm going li to be listening in on tomorrow. I go to workshops, trainings, etc. because there's just so much to learn and no one will ever truly be 
knowledgeable about every aspect of culture ever. It's not possible. But what I like to say is it's not a one and done. So, you know, I know this is your second year of this. This is fantastic. And this is exactly what you're doing. It's not, it wasn't a check the box, say, hey, we had one session, check. Hey, we're all culturally competent and you move on. That's not what we're talking about at all. And then I thought this was fantastic because to Cindy's point about how we're doing this, the personal, the organizational, communal, it totally dovetails with this, cultural competency. It starts on an individual level and then it moves to an organizational level and then systems and it affects our awareness, our knowledge and our skills. And there's a whole cultural competence continuum, which I'm not gonna talk about today, but you can be anywhere on this continuum based upon what the culture is and culture is very dynamic and so like I said there's no way you could ever possibly know everything there is to know about any culture. The reason why I started off with that name exercise is when we look at our identity one of the first things we are assigned at birth besides our sex is our name and it is so loaded because just with the two experiences that were shared and what you heard in your pairs or small groups our names are a primary part of who we are. How many people have had the experience of and several people mentioned this people constantly mispronounce your name or they call you a name that is not your name at all. <laughs> or, I can't pronounce your name and I'm not gonna make the effort, so I'll call you something else entirely, <laughs> right? So because I do this work, I tend to, like if I didn't catch your name the first time or I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, I, could you repeat that? It might take a couple of times and then I go off of that because that is just so vitally important to who we are. But then when we move on to other aspects of who we are, this primary stuff, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, it's pretty much a lot of the stuff that we can see. You'll hear me say a lot during this presentation, I would perceive this person's whatever to be, recognizing that my perception may be wrong, and that may not be how that person self-identifies. And when we do some exercises later, you'll see how this works out. So it's those things like race and ethnicity and age, which we could oftentimes be wrong about, right? Or someone's gender identity or your sexual orientation, all of those things. Especially though when we talk about able-bodied status, mental versus physical abilities. Have you ever had the experience of seeing someone get out of a disabled parking space, and in the back of your minds, you're like, what? That person doesn't look like he or she needs it, right? We've probably all done it. I've done it, okay? Who am I to sit there, I want to see your certificate of disability to be able to use that parking space? Um, I experience that a lot because my husband is visually impaired, um, but he's low vision, so he uses a cane um, if it's an unfamiliar environment. And so if he's walking with me, he may not use his cane and then he'll pull it out and I'll see people kind of like, well, what are you like, what's going on? Because they're like, you can't, you were just walking fine and now you have a cane. Then we go to our next level, secondary, religion. For the most part, you can't look at someone and tell what their religion is. Yes, there are religious symbols, there are religious dress. Most of the time I'm not walking around, oh, I think that person's this, I think this person's that. No, usually not. But it could be your communication style, your relationship style. Status. What's your language or accent? And accents, don't people tend to focus on foreign accents, even though every single one of us has an accent, if we admit it, right? I'm from Connecticut originally, moved to Minnesota. I never picked up the Minnesota accent, even though I lived there for six years. My husband still has it, because that's where he's from. Although we wouldn't have that whole ordeal in the beginning, you know, but basically we need to recognize that and think of when we talk about implicit bias, how one's accent or perceived accent, we think of different things about people based upon that. Um, and then we move on to organizationally, lots of different things. So what industry are we in? What's your work experience like? Where do you fall in the company? Are you a new person? Have you been there your entire career? Are you in management? Are you a frontline staff person? And then we move on to cultural things, such as it could be time orientedness. There are some cultures who are more oriented towards the past, the ancestors. There are some who are more present oriented versus others who are future oriented. I need to save money for my kids to go to college and retirement and whatever to pass along generational wealth, etc. right? But what about something as simple as greetings? How do we tend to greet people when you meet someone for the first time? Handshake. Other ways. Saying hi. Saying hi. And it doesn't have to be someone you met for the first time, just people you meet in general, whether it's your friends, your relatives, your coworkers. So we've got handshake, hi. Kisses on the cheek, yes. That can get difficult, right? The kisses on the cheek, right? It's like, is it two, is it three? Do you start on the right side? Do you start on the left side, right? Okay, what else? Yes? Smile or nod. Smile or nod, exactly, right. 
Hugs, yes. Yes, although in this era right now, you know, I, one, I will say I'm a reformed hugger, and what I mean by that is the huggers in the room, what happens when you try to hug a non-hugger? <laughs> Doesn't go well, does it? Yeah, yeah. So now I ask first, like, are you, oh, you're a hugger. Okay, you get a hug. No, you get a handshake, because it can be very awkward. And I will also tell you, too, in this Me Too era, although I'll talk about it a little bit later, some of my male colleagues who I'm dear friends with, they are now very leery of hugging. They're like, you know what, now I know we've been hugging for 10 years, I'm just going to shake your hands because they don't want any misconception about that. Whereas the hug used to be pretty innocuous depending on, right? Now people definitely ask permission. So now think of all these different ways that people can greet one another. Is anyone walking around, I don't have a name badge on today, but if I did, you know, is anyone walking around, you know, you're at work, you're in the community, okay, remember when interacting with this culture, they kiss, but oh gosh, is it three, is it le No, no one, you know, you're going to mess up, you know, and I, I think of something I learned in some of my early diversity and inclusion trainings or cultural competency trainings. And I like to say, you know those little cookbooks that tell you when dealing with this group, do X or Y, when dealing with this group, do X or Y, they're nice to know, but they run the risk of cultural stereotyping. I'll give you two examples. One thing I was taught is, okay, if I'm in an Orthodox Jewish community as a woman, I should not shake the hand of a man. Or if I'm in a Muslim community as a woman, I should not shake the hand of a man, opposite sex person, right? So we all keep that in the back of your minds, right? Well, the problem with that is I went to, it was the end of Ramadan. We have one mosque in my county. I live in Hartford County. I went to an iftar, the end of, you know, breaking the fast dinner, and I got this in the back of my mind, right? Okay, remember, don't shake, right? Okay, so I'm sitting down. Well, one of the members of the mosque, a man, came up to me and put his arm around me. Ding, 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 all these bells go off. But, but, but in the book it said, <laughs> What do I do? Do I say, but the book said you're not supposed Yeah, just I just went with it. I was like, well, obviously he's more maybe acclimated or more comfortable, and you just go with it. The other thing is, is say if I had gone to shake his hand and he didn't respond positively, I would probably say, okay, I messed up. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Usually the person's gracious and might tell me, yeah, you know, I don't feel comfortable with that, and you move forward. But we're all gonna make mistakes, and believe me, I have. Culture, boy, this is a lot of stuff. It's communications, it's actions, it's beliefs, it's values. These are all passed down by our different cultural groups to which we belong, whether it's your racial group, your religious group. Think of our traditions. All of that kind of stuff that's passed down is what defines culture. So when I just mentioned greetings, that's an aspect of that. Things such as courtesies, or customs, or how we communicate, or our language. Remember when I talked about identities and the different layers? What I like to say is what gets us in trouble sometimes is the stuff that's above the waterline. That's the stuff that divides us. When we look at that stuff that's above the waterline, I'll call them physical characteristics, when you come into like a session like this, or you're on a flight, and you're, say if you're on Southwest and you don't have assigned seating, or you're on public transportation, or just any group setting, right? How do you decide where to sit, right? Do people just, oh, that's an open seat, I want to sit there, or oh no, I don't want to sit in the front, I want to sit in the back, or is it, well, I don't know those people and they look a little scary, or that person has orange hair, or that person's overweight or obese, or that person has too many tattoos or gauges and piercings, oh, that person looks, yeah. is that what's going through our mind? So the social experiment that I'll remind you about later is, next time you're in one of those situations, people watch. And you'll kind of see what's going through people's minds. I know watching, when I'm sitting on the metro or something, I'll see people walking down the aisle, and it's like, open seat, right? And I'm like, end of the day, I just want to sit. I don't care who I'm sitting next to. And you'll see people pass up empty seats, like, mm 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 mm, -mm. <laughs> Oh, definitely not, no. Mm -mm. You know, and that's what we do as human beings. That's all an example of implicit bias based on any one of these aspects of our culture. What I think is the richness in our common humanity is all this stuff underneath here. When we start talking to people, that's when you find out you have something in common. That person who on the outside, based upon physical characteristics, may seem like, oh, you can't possibly have anything in common. You start talking, oh my gosh, you know so-and-so? We went to the same college? We live in the same town? Oh my gosh, you wouldn't know that until you start talking to people. But fear is real and people are very afraid of starting those conversations because am I gonna use the wrong word or the wrong term or the wrong this or the wrong that? Remember what I said earlier? We're gonna mess up. You know, as long as we're not using slurs of some sort, and we're gonna talk about different kinds, usually the person will be gracious and you can keep that conversation going. It's just really going out there, making yourself uncomfortable so you can find the common humanity with other people. One thing to keep in mind is that diversity without inclusion will not work. What we mean by this is, and I'm sure 
We all do this when you look around rooms and our organizations, our neighborhoods, our schools, our communities. We have diversity, or we may or may not have diversity. So we count people, right? I have this many millennials, this many boomers, this many Gen Xers, this many this, this many that, right? The problem with that, that's great, don't we want inclusion where the people are integrated through our organization? People will say that diversity is counting people versus inclusion is making people feel as if they count. What's important to that though is that that's really the key component to achieving diversity in this work that we're trying to do. And so you're doing it right now with professional development and education. But then we need to put that both into policy and practice. And then when you have policies and practices, holding people accountable to those policies and practices. And what we want to achieve is fostering this belonging, respect, value, and engagement for our fellow human beings, whether it's in the workplace or our synagogues or our communities, our clients, etc. I'm going to go through a couple phrases and you know you can nod your head or raise your hand if you agree. So one is treating others the way you would like to be treated. Valuing and appreciating differences. Changing people's biases. Respect. I'm not Aretha so I won't sing that but R-E-S-P-E-C-T. <laughs> Treat everyone the same. Tolerance. Or is it really dignity and respect? So all of these are great, they're a great start, but when we talk about treating others the way you would like to be treated, remember that used to be the golden rule, right? Now we try to do what we call the platinum rule, where as much as possible I try to find out how that other person wants to be treated, because the way I maybe want to be treated may not be the way you want to be treated. So I can't use my assumptions and treat everyone like that. That goes along with that treat everyone the same. How many people have heard that? Oh, we don't have any problems here, we treat everyone the same. But everyone's not the same. We're all unique individuals. We may have unique needs. Valuing and appreciating differences, I think that's a great, that's a key, key component. Changing people's biases, I think that's fantastic. I think, if anything, you might help people become aware of their biases, especially starting with your own when possible. You might not necessarily be able to help people change their biases. That, that's kind of the more difficult aspect of that. Respect key, key component. Tolerance, remember that used to be a great word, but if I tolerate you, I may not respect you. You know, so okay, I have to work with you and I'll tolerate that you're there, but I'm not really gonna include you and I'm not gonna keep you in the loop on things and when we have socials, I'm not gonna invite you, you know? You're there, I tolerate your existence, but I don't really respect you. The main thing is the journey towards diversity and inclusion really begins with treating everyone with dignity and respect. And actually, before I go on, two examples of uh, the difference between diversity and inclusion. So this is the boardroom. So in many places when I go to boardrooms, there's usually some really long conference table, right? And you have chairs along the wall. So it, we may have diversity in that we have different people coming to the boardroom or coming to a meeting. But how included are the people who are not sitting around the actual table? The people who are sitting along the walls, they're in the meeting, but do they feel as empowered and as engaged to be able to speak up? Have you ever been in one of those meetings where you're the person who's sitting along the wall, right? Versus someone who's actually sitting around the table and you really see that power differential? Or it's Thanksgiving. You're invited to the Thanksgiving dinner, but you're relegated to the kiddie table, <laughs> right? You're there, but you're like, what? I didn't come here to sit with the little kids. What are you doing, you know? Yeah, diversity, we invited you, but you know, we're not very inclusive because you're sitting at the kiddie table. Both great examples. So let's talk a little bit about changing demographics and why some of this is important. So quickly I'll talk about race and ethnicity and language and gender identity, sexual orientation, and of course because of who we are, an aspect of religion and spirituality. So with race and ethnicity, you know, we've probably heard about the browning and graying of the United States. We're becoming more racially and ethnically diverse and we are aging rapidly. So it's interesting for me, I, it's almost hard for me to believe, because I was not around in 1950, that our country was about 90% non-Hispanic white. And by 2000 it was about 68% non-Hispanic white. And what's interesting is, is that I can't say for the first time because the indigenous people were here before the rest of us, but in July 2011, that was the second time I will say in our history where the majority of births were to racial and ethnic minorities, including multiracial children. You've probably heard something about somewhere between 2042 or 20, I'll say mid-century. <laughs> mid-century because the dates change all the time. We're gonna become a majority minority country so we're gonna have to change our terminology. You had someone, I think Amy had mentioned something about words and language, right? How can you be considered a minority when you're actually in the numerical majority? 
So what are we going to do with this language we've been using, this antiquated language? So we already have four states, Hawaii, California, New Mexico, and Texas. And if you go to the District of Columbia, those are all already a majority minority states, even Baltimore City, majority minority states and then cities. Really, it's interesting because even Maryland, we're on that trajectory. We'll probably be there within the next at least 10 years, if not sooner. We're already around 45, 46 percent racial and ethnic minority. And depending on where you live, like we're here in Baltimore City, right? When you go to Baltimore, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Montgomery, Prince George's, Howard, it's very diverse. And so do we reflect our communities? When you get to organizations, you're going to be talking about, you know, do your boards reflect the people you serve? Do your employees reflect the people that you serve? Keeping all that in mind. How about English language proficiency? And this can be a big issue for all of us. And I know being here, I know Pikesville is right next door. When I taught Russian history, I used to bring my, I'd get all my stuff from the different um, Russian delis and I'd have teas for my students. And I'd love walking in and being able to speak a different language. But that's not always taken very well in this country. You know, it's why can't everyone just speak English and what's going, you know, et cetera, et cetera. With that in mind, um, this happens to be a healthcare example, but I think it's so, so powerful. What it's like for someone who doesn't speak English, actually this person is speaking English, but what it's like for someone to navigate when they cannot communicate with other people. And we'll think about how does this apply to your synagogues. I know, Jessica, we were talking about elder care, or if you're working with youth, or if you're working with the community, or your own synagogue. If someone walks in and they don't have English as their first language. I'm so sorry. She's been crying nonstop. She has a temperature of 105. I don't know what to do. No, please. Just every time I see her, she throws up. I don't know. Vi parolas la sant. What are you saying? You just look at her. No, she's burning up. Just feel. Vi parolas la anglan. What? She's burning up. Feel her head. Tranquilly, 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 can I check? Um, the mother is Aska. What is he doing? What do you have? My my baby, uh, she's got a temperature of 105. She every time I feed her, she throws up. Please don't uh, can you can I skill avoid temporary school? No, she's burning up, feel her head. No rapid. Uh, please, just just please just feel her head. Feel her head. Just someone let me in the door. No, does anyone understand what I'm saying? Please, someone help me. Eight percent of U.S. citizens speak limited English. For these 25 million Americans, professional interpreters can mean the difference between life and death. So, has anyone ever been in that kind of a situation personally, or dealt with clients? Would anyone be willing to share? Okay. I worked at a pub at a local hospital where we needed the use of interpreters, and and I had to use them at times mm -hmm. to, to interpret what my clients were saying. Excellent. Thank you for actually using interpreters because oftentimes, I mean, we're not going to turn this into a healthcare session, but I know some of you, you work with elders, you work with youth, we're talking education. How do you navigate any of these systems? You're filling out an application for something. What do they do? They thrust a paper in her face. I can't read this, right? How do you navigate any of these systems when you don't speak or understand or read, right? So thank you for using interpreters. Yeah, I was just yeah. going to say that I was, um, I needed, I was traveling abroad and um, needed police support at one point, and like, I, I wouldn't say that we got support, but <laughs> the police did come. I don't know what the, the, what the language barrier made it impossible for us to really navigate. And then also, too, that's a frightening situation, and the inability to communicate. What if it were a life-threatening situation? You probably wouldn't have been able to get your point across and get the help that you needed. I led an overseas program where I was responsible for 15 college students, and I had one who got very sick, and we had to go to the hospital, and I didn't speak the language and there were also a lot of cultural differences so they didn't have clean water so I had, a, I had my driver who was with us who did interpreting for me but then it was like we need to get fluids for this person. Okay, where do I get fluids? It's two o'clock in the morning um, and the hospital wasn't, didn't have the resources available so trying to navigate even getting the health care that this student needed was very scary and thankfully there was someone there to help navigate that but if I was by myself it would have not gone quite so well. Um, this wasn't a crisis but I was in the Peace Corps in West Africa and um, 
you know, they gave us language training, local language training, and what was really interesting is some people could hear you speak like a three-year-old or a four-year-old, which is how I sounded initially, and still treat me like an adult, and other people would just crack up, you know, because my vocabulary was so limited. So it really, it really um, changed how I interpreted other people speaking English in a limited way. One of the programs that I work with at JCS is called Myths for Mobility. We provide essential rides for clients to medical appointments and government agencies. And at one time, we supplied most of our drivers for the use of them driving Russian language or Farsi language speaking clients. Um, a list of communicable phrases that they could use. And today, due to smartphones, now they just use a translator app. They speak English into the app. It translates to the client in any language that they speak. They can speak their native language, and it translates it back to the driver in English. So it's a win-win situation. Yeah. So that's great because Excuse me. that's talking about the use of technology and how it can assist. Now, the one caution I will say about those apps sometimes and I did a session with the American Translators Association last October. I took some phrases, I found some great phrases online, and we ran them through Google Translate, and they completely did not come out when they were spit at into English and then translated back. It just was gobbledygook, it was garbage. But it can help you, you know, but, and that's great for being able to communicate there, but when people are in healthcare settings or educational settings or criminal justice or social services, yeah, okay, you can't understand this consent form, you're signing your life away, let me use Google Translate. That is not so great there, but definitely instances like that, just basic communication, that can be fantastic. As many times as I've seen this, and I should have told you what the acronym meant, it's the Texas Association of Healthcare Interpreters and Translators. This video clip is on YouTube, but it came out in 2010. And as many times as I've seen this and having kids, it's just, I'm, you can feel the tension at the end of this, you know, because there's, do you see any empathy in here at all? You know, it's just like, oh, another one of those people who can't speak our language and, you know, whatever, you know. And when we talked about you used an interpreter, so someone who actually was a trained interpreter, they're using some random guy out in the waiting room. Sometimes we use people's children. So imagine you're the child going in, it's your IEP, your individualized education plan and the educational system, and your parents don't read or speak English, but we're having you serve as the interpreter for your parents as they decide, are you going to special ed or are you going here? Are you getting mental health services? I mean, it's really putting people in a very, very difficult position. So at the end of this, it said 8% of Americans. So actually, and I, I would encourage you, um, American Fact Finder is part of census.gov. You can get great data on your own community, whether it's the zip code level, your county, your state. It's great when you're trying to plan what you're doing, and not just for language, race, ethnicity, vacant housing units, educational level, foreign-born populations, people who are limited English proficient. It's a great way to learn more about your community. So we have more people who are born abroad, so foreign-born residents, more who speak a language other than English at home. So you could be someone who comes to school and you're a child and you do speak English in school, but the rest of the time you're not in school, you speak some other language. And then lastly, those who speak English less than very well, that's a legal term, which defines our limited English proficient population. So if the trades returned and she weren't speaking English, she would be one of our LEP people. And you all gave great examples of people who would need those services. Um, what's interesting is, has anyone ever heard, oh, you know, English is the official language of the US? We don't have one. We're not like France where it's English and French or you go to some other countries and they have four or five. We don't have one actually. So what was interesting is back in 2009, there was an idea that there were at least 322 languages that had been captured by the US Census. That number's now up to 350. We happen to be here in Maryland and we are at 117. Even states that we don't think of as diverse, like, okay, I'm from Connecticut, but I'll say Maine, 74 because of increase, whether it's refugees or migrants or whatever. So this is a hot topic for many people. I mentioned people where English is not their first language, but what about if you're an English speaking person and you have low literacy, right? And you don't read very well, or you're functionally illiterate. Take a minute to try to read this. So, okay, dating myself, think of tape, cassette tape, boom boxes, the two little spinning heads in there. You had to clean them with rubbing alcohol and cotton swabs. You know, there's a capstan in there. It's like, what is that? First of all, the letters are in reverse. Did anyone just give up? I'm looking around the room and a couple people are like, well, forget it, right? <laughs> I'm done. Well, this is what it looks like. And we communicate a lot through written text, right? 
they get you know mortgage applications or your clothes, whatever it is you know here's a pile of papers good luck and you see people struggling to try to read these kinds of things so this English language proficiency isn't just for those where English is not your first language it's even for those where English is their first language so keep literacy in mind too because that's an aspect of diversity as well so sexual orientation and gender identity so what's interesting is is that the number of Americans identifying as LGBT is increasing based upon the Pew Research Center in 2012 it was about three and a half percent of the population and now it's about four and a half four point one percent of the population totaling about nine million people so that's more than the population of the state state of New Jersey, which is not a small state. And what's interesting though is, and I love this because I love to see stratified data, it's great to see a group as a whole, but let's be intersectional and break this down a little bit. They break it down gender-wise, race, age, and household income. And they could go even further. If you look at household income and you break it up by race or age or whatever, we would see vast differences. What's interesting is, is this is showing throughout the country and the darker blue colors are showing you the areas that actually have the largest LGBT population being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Sometimes you'll see a Q there, queer or questioning. Sometimes you'll see an I for intersex. Sometimes there's a plus because there are a multiplicity of other terms people may use to identify themselves. And then what's interesting too is I love this because we're going to talk about families too a little in a little bit. So even with same-sex couples, this was from comparing the 2000 to 2010 census. Between 2000 and 2010, the percentage of same-sex unmarried partners, inc because they couldn't get married in their states often, was almost 64%, increased almost 64%, and then same-sex spouses increased almost 200%. And the reason why that's relevant because it was it's hard to believe almost three years ago the Supreme Court case that made marriage equality the law of the land versus versus federal law versus on a state by state basis. So something to keep in mind. So religion and spirituality, I thought this was really interesting. So religiosity in the US, and this is according to a 2017 Gallup poll. My, I looked back at an old presentation, it was from 2011, 2012. These numbers have changed a little bit. So according to that Gallup poll, 87% of people said that they believe in God. 74% said that religion is very important or fairly important in their lives. 55% believed that religion can answer all or most of today's problems. Interestingly, it asked, do you happen to be a member of a church, a synagogue, or a mosque? 54%. Note, a little over 25 years ago, that number was at 70%. That is a huge drop. A question I didn't add that was on here asked, have you attended a church, synagogue, or mosque within the last seven days? And those numbers were pretty around 45%, so not great. And then the percentage of people who don't feel affiliated with any sort of organized religion is increasing substantially. So as we're thinking as faith communities, as synagogues, right, how do we reach out to our community members to get people to want to come? Are we being welcoming? Taking into consideration all the things we're talking about right now. And then religious diversity in the U.S., and I have another slide that no one would really be able to read, but they take all the different religions, break them down into de denominations, and it's like amazing. But for all, our purposes, I looked um, overall, so yes, we're a largely Christian nation, but you know, you break it down into different categories, but at least among our Jewish population, it's about 1.7% of adults responding, broken down by reform, conservative, orthodox, and other. So for our purposes, keeping in mind, who are we? So the fun part, all that stuff we just talked about, that's all going to factor into implicit bias. So keep that in mind. So what's implicit bias? So like I said, I like to use video clips. This is an example of implicit bias. And one thing I need to say about implicit bias is that there's implicit bias, the stuff we're unaware of, and then there's explicit stuff, which I will call our isms, right? And we implicit bias makes people feel more comfortable because like, oh, I didn't know, right? Well, you don't, now you know, right, about something. You need to act differently. I think of Maya Angelou, she's like, when we know better, we do better, right? So the explicit stuff are the isms, whether it's racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, classism, whatever. You know, that's the isms. That's the stuff people do on purpose. But, and I should say too, I mentioned I use international examples. I forgot to use the preface. This is actually an example from Greece. So there are little subtitles on the bottom.
το όνομα μου. Και εσύ. Ο γιατρό είπε όλοι σα. Καλημέρα. Καλημέρα. Ανούλα, τι βλέπω. Ομόρφιος μετά την επέμβαση, ε. Συμβαίνει κάτι, γιατρέ. Όχι, κάθε άλλο. Να σας γνωρίσω τον Τζαφάρ. Είναι ο δότης μυαλού των οστών για την Άννα. Shell, what that was talking about. First of all, did you see how they reacted in the waiting room? It wasn't very nice. Like, oh my gosh, musical chairs, don't sit next to that guy over there, right? Think of from a child's perspective, what kind of message is that sending to a kid? Be afraid of people or right, people look like him, right? So they go in, and this is a doctor's appointment, and they're kind of wondering, wait, why is this guy coming in with us, right? So the doctor says, oh, Anula, you look prettier since the operation. And, oh, thank you, thank you. And the dad asks, wait, is something wrong? Who's, who's this guy? And so the doctor introduces him as Zafar, who is Anula's bone marrow donor. So basically, he saved her life so that she could have a bone marrow transplant. So he was the donor. And can you imagine? So this is the guy who saved your daughter's life, and you've just treated him to, right, completely shabbily, horribly, rudely in the waiting room. So for me, that is just so powerful. What I noticed right away is that um, when the little girl, when they first walked in, she sat down right next to him and didn't even, like, she smiled and it was the parents. So it's how much of it is learned in, right. compared to what's natural. Absolutely. Thank you. No, you're absolutely right. Because for the most part, you know, I know people say, oh, I don't see color. Kids see color, but they don't usually ascribe anything negative to it, right? Unless they see things like this, behavior like that. Well, again, what kind of messaging are we sending to our children? So I just thought that was such a powerful example. It's like, oh my gosh, you know? Just not a very nice way to treat an individual. So what is it? What do we mean by implicit bias? So this is a term that was coined back in 1995 by some researchers, Mazarin Banaji and Anthony Greenwald, and their team of researchers at the University of Virginia, University of Washington, and Harvard. And they use some terms interchangeably. So in this presentation, I use implicit bias. Sometimes I'll use unconscious bias. You'll hear hidden bias, inherent bias, intrinsic bias. It's all talking about the internal bias of which we are unaware. And what it means is, what they came up with is that much of our social behavior is driven by learned stereotypes. Stereotypes. So that's what you were talking about, right? Learned behavior that operates automatically, so it's unconsciously, and it happens when we interact with other people. Other things are their attitudes or stereotypes, and they actually affect our understanding, our actions, our decisions. They're involuntary, so they're without our awareness or our voluntary control. The thing is, though, they're not accessible through introspection, so I can't sit there like, okay, what unconscious biases do I have? It doesn't, they're not gonna come to me like that. It's really when I get into different situations, and because I do this work, I'm probably almost hypersensitive to, oh my gosh, did I do that because of X or Y? I'm gonna actually share throughout the presentation some of the now they're not unconscious because now I'm aware of them in some different situations. Also though, people who engage in this unthinking discrimination, which is what it is, we're not aware of the fact that we do this. And this is from my colleague, Dr. David Williams at the Harvard School of Public Health. Now what's interesting is as human beings, we categorize everything, right? Types of tables. These are rectangular tables that have been made square versus oval or round tables, birds, bees, colors, you name it, right? We do that with people. So once something is mapped into a category, it's very difficult to put it into a different category. Think of it with people. Have you ever had an encounter with someone, you met the person for a first time, and you didn't have those warm, fuzzy feelings, right? But over time, you developed a great relationship, you trusted the person, but did that happen overnight? Right? It took a long time to go from, mm, 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 we're not having it, you know, now, all right, we're fine. So it's so difficult for us to do that. Some biases are, and I tell people, every single human being has multiple unconscious biases of which they are unaware. But as I said, there's that difference between implicit, I almost want to call that the feel good word, let's blame it all on implicit bias. I just didn't know. I didn't know I was being sexist. Okay, well, you know, we're pointing out, you know, and the idea of this is not to say you're label people, you're a racist, you're a sexist, you're this, you're that. Okay, you're now we're helping you become aware of these biases. What can we do differently? But they don't 
necessarily align with our declared beliefs. So for example, I could be in a situation with a homeless person and what's running through my mind are all the stereotypes about homeless people, right? I'm not gonna give him money because he's gonna use it for drugs or alcohol and this and that and blah, blah, blah. Yet I'm someone who works in a homeless shelter or volunteers. That wouldn't be my, that doesn't align with my declared belief at all, right? Also, they affect our behaviors, and I'll, we'll talk about some examples of this. But I will say, I don't think we'll ever be able to completely eliminate them, but I think we can kind of unlearn some and change them a little bit. Now, what's interesting is there's a whole neuroscience behind this. And in fact, um, at the Ohio State University, there is an institute, the Kerwin Institute on Race and Ethnicity. And when I talk about additional reading, they have an implicit, a science of implicit bias review. It's a whole literature review on implicit bias that year. And it's been coming out every year since 2013. So if you're ever interested in, I wanna learn about implicit bias in religious communities or in education or sports or this or that, rather than you having to do the legwork, they do it for you. Now, what this is like though, is remember, we all had that fight or flight. We had to know very quickly, friend or foe, is this thing going to eat me? Make the wrong decision, you're not gonna be here, right? But our brains still operate from the amygdala <laughs> doing that. So two great examples of how our brains operate unconsciously. So a couple people at the beginning were talking about it's a short week, right? Okay, so say on Friday, you normally take your regular work route to work or school or wherever, right? But Friday, you don't have to go to work. What happens when somehow your mind automatically, I wanted to go to the grocery store. What the heck? Why am I going to, towards work? Right? Has that ever happened to anyone? Right? Yes. The car does that. Uh, something somehow it has a hold of me. It's dragging me to work, right? Or have you ever had the experience of getting somewhere? You've driven, you've walked, whatever, and you're like, whoa. I got here, but I don't really remember driving. Yeah. That is your brain working on autopilot, I like to say. And that's that part of the brain we're using for this unconscious bias. So they're just, those are all just examples. So we're going to do a little experiment here. It's kind of fun. Basically, you might have seen this. It's the Stroop Effect experiment. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the first two lines starting left, reading left to right, and we're going to name what the color is. So if we start in the upper left-hand corner with this, what color is that? Red. Okay. Pretty easy, right? Okay, we're gonna do the same thing on the next slide and we're gonna name the color. So what's the color? Blue. Whoa, what's going on here? <laughs> I saw some stumbling on the first one, right? We said, what is our brain tricking us into doing, right? Because probably we can all read, I would perceive that we can all read in this room, right? Instead of us focusing on the, the actual color, your brain's tricking you to read the word. That's how our brain makes associations. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Through priming, you might have heard of priming exercises, a fun thing in psychology. So the first thing we're gonna do is, what does a rabbit do? It likes to hop, right? Okay, so we're gonna say the word hop 10 times, right? Okay, so let's begin. Hop, 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 hop. What do you do with a green light? Oh, you had to think about it. I just primed you to say stop, right? Because you've got that and you're right. We all know you're supposed to go, but yes, I heard a couple people say go, and also I heard a pause. Think about it, right? But that's what we do. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do is say the word white 10 times. Ready? Okay. White, 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 white. What does a cow drink? Milk. Water. Oh, wait. Yes, water. But those who said water weren't yeah. that quick to say water. You have to think because I've just primed you with this first one, right? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, that's my next one, actually. Darn it, yes. So he got, yes. So he's on to me. So that's exactly what the next thing was. We were going to say the word roast 10 times, and then it was like, what do you put into a toaster? Thank you. And most people, well, usually people start at this point by the third one, eh, I'm on to her. They'll say bread, but some people will still say toast. So that's how you, you know. So what that means is that we can be trained to think differently. So that's what priming is actually. What it is, it's human memory and it attaches certain things. So the fact, if you see something that's yellow and it's shaped kind of like a 
sort of a crescent, you know, oh, yellow, banana, they're related, right? So now maybe if you see something that's green, is that a plantain or is that a this or a that? So it's basically ways to train our minds to do something that's counter stereotypical to what we're thinking. So that's how priming exercises are used. So now we're gonna start talking about how implicit bias works in everyday life. This is a video that went viral last, yeah, it was last year actually, 2017. Scandals happen all the time. The question is how do democracies respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for, uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift, shifting, shifting sands in the region, do you think relations with the North may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> The, um, pardon me. Pardon me. My apologies. What is this going to be for the region? My apologies. North, uh, sorry. Um, North Korea, North, uh, South Korea's policy choices on North Korea have been severely limited. Basically, every work at home parent's nightmare, right? Right, so you might recall, some of you had seen this, who did people think the woman in the video was? Nanny. The nanny, right? I've gotta tell you, even some of my friends who do diversity and inclusion work, we were talking about this. Did you see that video that went viral? Yeah, that nanny looked so afraid. And they do this work too. Remember I said, we mess up? And I was like, well, what would make you think that she's the nanny? Well, and I'm like, but she's not the nanny. And yes, I accidentally went forward. But yes, this is um, Professor Robert Kelly. They live in South Korea. His wife, Juna Kim, and their children, Marion and James. And those kids are so cool. They're actually making a little cartoon about them. <laughs> you know, what I thought was hilarious, though, is, you know, you can see he works at home because he's trying to make the bedroom or whatever, the study, look a little more professional. You saw the book fall off the bed. You know, I mean, it was, it was just hilarious. But that's a great example of how implicit bias works in everyday life. When we see people together, we're like, wait, one of these things does not look like the other. I'm thinking back to Sesame Street or something like that, right? So they changed that song, Sesame Street. It used to be one of these things just doesn't belong, and then they changed it to one of these things just isn't the same. Um, and because they didn't want you to think that if it was different, it didn't belong. It was a change they made in the 90s, I think, which is really cool. I mean, that's a great, Sesame exactly. Street's a great program. Right, because what that implies is that difference is bad, right? And that's not the message we want to send to our kids, yes. As a left-handed person, of course, we're the only people in our right mind, but we do not... And everyone, if you could speak up, I'm sorry, thank you. We do not like the term left out. Right, because that's making up, that's a negative connotation. Everything left has been a negative connotation. Excuse my reach. Absolutely. And remember, Amy, I think you mentioned at the beginning, language. We're going to talk about how language matters. The Latin for left is sinister. Sadly, that's not surprising because remember there was a time where if someone actually went to school and they were left-handed, teachers tried to make you be a right-handed person, right? I know my brother and my father are left-handed and my mother told the teacher, no, he's left-handed, let him be left-handed. We know he's left-handed. But the left has always been viewed as bad. And the reason I don't write like this is because the first language I wrote was Hebrew. Ah, right, because you're going right to left instead of left to right. Right, he was saying his first language he wrote was Hebrew because typically, yes, the left-handed people do write with that kind of little hook. So my name is Beth and I just wanted to say very quickly that when I remember this came out on Facebook, a lot of my friends are professors and there was a great conversation um, thread among all of us um, about how on social media, not only was there a question as to whether the woman in this video was the nanny, but there was a great amount of anger toward her because she was a woman and b a minority why was she messing up why did she let the kids into the room and she messed up this poor white guy's whole you know national international recording so it was really really interesting the deep levels that this video brought out for many people no, thank you for sharing that, because some of the other issues along with that, you might have seen some of the spoof videos that were the reverse of this. It's the woman being interviewed, and she's diffusing a bomb, she's cooking dinner. I mean, they're really funny things, because then that's talk about stereotyping, too. You know, the women can do everything. We can multitask. You know, the, the husband comes in, honey, where are my shoes? And she's, you know, wait a minute, I'll get to that. And, you know, it's, it's very humorous. But this, again, shows you how our stereotypes and our biases come into play. The other thing is people seem, and you're right, people, the anger, 
was just fierce for this. And people were worried, is the nanny gonna lose her job? Mm -hmm. She looks afraid, right? Now, what was interesting is, had that been a female professor speaking, a lot of people said, would, they, would everyone have been so forgiving? Because mm -hmm. yeah, we all laughed, it's funny. But would they have been, oh, she is just so unprof unprofessional. Why couldn't someone keep her, her kids in check? And what if it was the husband or a same-sex partner who came in? Would our angst have been as high? Mm -hmm. I don't know. But it's just interesting when you think of gender roles and who's the power differential, et cetera. So yes, our idea of families, we think of what the traditional family or what was the nuclear family and now that's changed. I mean, it could be grandparents raising their grandchildren. It could be a lesbian couple raising their children, a gay male couple raising their children. It could be a single parent house, it could be any number of things. Blended families, remember, okay, I told you I'm dating myself 70s and 80s, but I think of the Brady Bunch, how that's very much more like how things are today for many families, extended families, multiple generations. So when we just think of family as mom, dad, 2.4 kids, although I don't know how you can have a 0.2 or 0.4 kid, but how that's not really the reality anymore, we really need to expand our definition. We've all heard this, right? First impressions matter. And we size people up when we meet them. What are things you notice about someone when you meet them? And as you shout them out, I'll just repeat them back so I don't have to run the mic around to all areas of the room, but feel free. What do you notice about someone when you meet them? Height. Height. Gender. Gender. Color. Color. Age. 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 Accent. Accent. Weight. 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 What they're wearing. Affect. Affect. On the subway, how they smell. Yes, <laughs> that, on the subway, how they smell, yes. Hair. Hair. Anything else you notice? Personal hygiene. Personal hygiene. How they're dressed. How they're dressed. Expression. Expression. So someone said accent. So we, oftentimes before the person even opens his or her mouth, we're already pulling in everything, you know, and made some decision about this person, right? They haven't even talked, right? Think about for an interview. We've sized you up and I've already decided you're not a good fit and I've just taken all of this in. And I haven't really talked about your resume, your qualifications, I'm just looking at you, mm -mm -mm. not a good fit for our organization. Oftentimes happens. So with that, how long do you have to make a first impression? And it's a time frame. How long? A minute? 15 seconds? Three seconds? Immediately, right. So the literature that I found said seven seconds, but we just named 10 items, and sometimes this goes on, you know, people name 15, 20, whatever, however many items that our brains process in a matter of seconds, and we make a decision about that based on a person. We're gonna do a little exercise here where we're gonna either look at a face or a name, and what would be our perceptions about that person? And you know how this is applicable? It could be your everyday lives. We hear that there's a new neighbor, or someone's walking around the neighborhood, or this is the new person coming into the job, or this is a new client, and think of how those biases can come into play. If you saw this person, what would be your perception of this person? She seems nice, pretty, educated, educated young, good sense of humor, because of the big, broad smile, happy, Seems like a down-to-earth person. Economically advantaged. Economically advantaged. Now, what would make you think that? Um, so she has, I would presume she has money to spend on her hair. Yes. And I would, her clothing from the limited picture looks stylish. Okay. Her teeth. Her teeth. Yes. Yeah, so someone afforded orthodontics or else she has perfect teeth, right? Okay. We all have to fill out forms at some point, right? Those check boxes that we either love or hate. And usually it's our race, our ethnicity, and our gender. So if this person had to fill out those boxes, how do you think this person would identify racially, ethnically, and by ethnically recognizing there are hundreds of ethnicities, but on those forms, it's the two-part question, the five races, and then are you Hispanic or Latino? Yes or no? And then gender. What boxes do you think this person would check? Female, okay. And race, ethnicity? Black. Black? Latino. Latino? Latina? There's a joke in here. There's a joke in here, okay, we'll get to that, yes. Okay, how about this? Oftentimes, remember I mentioned name at the beginning? So what if you didn't have the picture of the person and it was the name first? Would your perception change? Monica Sony, Indian, not African American. Or, since someone presumed Indian, not African American, or Asian perhaps, is Monica the person's actual first name? Is it the anglicized name because got tired of being called something out of the person's name, right? 
So it sounds like our perceptions would change a little bit. So this is the next client on your list. This is that resume that just came across your desk. Or someone put out on next door, you know, for your neighborhood. Yeah, we heard the new neighbor's name is Monica Sony, right? So all some image pops up. And it may be this, it may not be this. Okay, so Monica is actually a real person. And if Monica filled out those boxes and self-identified, Monica would check off two race boxes, black and Asian. But if you asked further, Monica would check off or she would tell you that she's Jamaican and Asian Indian. So we were kind of half right on both regards. Gender-wise, and when we're thinking only binary, so male, female, recognizing that there's a whole continuum and you can identify as other things as well, would check the box female. So actually, this is an old picture of Monica. Monica has gone on to actually be a medical doctor and is out in California. So yes, doing quite well for herself, but is an actual person. So now we have your meeting is with Dr. Jean or Dr. Jean O'Brien. So, who, who is this person? What boxes would this, per what would be your perception? Yes, uh, Brittany? Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, I would assume, like, when I like, first read the name, I thought it would be a man automatically. But with the name Jean, I would think it'd be a woman. Okay. Yeah. It could be. Okay. What about doctor? What do you think of when you, for some reason, what do we jump to when you hear doctor so and so? Medical, yeah. Med medical doctor, as if that's the only doctor that exists in the world, right? Oh, PhD. Right, right, exactly. PhD. <laughs> Definitely. Could be EDD, JD, DDS. I mean, it could be any number of, right? Gender, you said, well, you said originally ma male, but now female because of Gene. Okay, what about, yes? What, white. White? Okay, wait, is it because of O'Brien? Yeah. Okay, yeah, O'Brien and St. Patty's Day was just a couple weekends ago. Yeah, okay. Could be, right, because the, what I said, Jean or Jean. Yeah. Right, and that would determine too, male or female, perhaps. Right. Because if it's a uh, man sometimes, and Jean could be spelled G-E-N-E, -E, or it's short for U-G, any number of Yevgeny, take your pick of right names. So what do we think the boxes will be? It sounds like white, not Hispanic, Latino, and are we saying male or female? Yes. Oh, no, that's not an answer. <laughs> female. Female? Female? Female. Okay. So this is Dr. Jean O'Brien. Is your perception still the same? A couple of them had saying no. So how is it different? Dr. Jean O'Brien, still female? Still female? Race, ethnicity wise? White? Okay. Any other guesses? PhD, yes. So Dr. Jean O'Brien is a PhD, identifies as female, but race wise is actually American Indian, White Earth Ojibwa, Minnesota. Is the O'Brien is, by the way, that is her last name, and throws people off. She's assumed to be a white woman doing American Indian history and is a PhD. How about, oh, this is an interesting one. Two civil rights pioneers from Alabama. And now it's the late Dr. Levi Watkins. He was a cardiac surgeon, invented the first implantable defibrillator in the early 80s, but he passed away, unfortunately, in 2015. Both he and Morris Dees are from Alabama. And he was at Johns Hopkins University. Morris Dees is still alive and well. He's at the Southern Poverty Law Center. One of these men is the son of sharecroppers. One of these men is the son of a college president. Which is which? You kind of, remember I said priming, trying to think of counter stereotypical examples? You are correct. So it turns out Morris Dees is actually the son of sharecroppers, but when we think historically, that can't possibly be the case. And actually, yes, Dr. Watkins was the son of a college president. So names, how that can be, Levi possibly being the son of a college president. So we put so much weight into names and who belongs to them. So I have a friend who is, her family is Costa Rican. If you saw her, you would identify, you would think she self-identified or you would perceive her to be a black or African-American woman. But her father's name is, it's not Levi, oh my gosh. It, it would be what someone, they lived in New Jersey when they came here and everyone assumed they were Jewish based upon her father's name because it was not a name perceived to be a black or a Costa Rican name. So can you imagine, you know, oh, we're emailing this person. We've all had this, right? You're emailing someone, you talk to them on the phone and then you meet them for the first time. Whoa, that mental picture did not, got you, right? Along with names, here's a humorous one, and I didn't have time to put it in this one, but um, NPR has some great podcasts, Code Switch, etc. What's in a name? So there's a young teacher, he moved to Iowa, his name is Jamal, right? And when they asked for a profile, Jamal's heroes were Muhammad Ali, his favorite sport was basketball, his name was Jamal. He shows up to work, and guess what? The person at the front desk says, oh, I thought you would be taller. Well, it turns out Jamal is actually white. And, and he, yeah, the humor was, I don't think the secretary meant to say taller, she's probably, but that was probably, and there was an awkward pause before taller came out, but so much weight was placed upon the name, 
can't possibly match that person. So, been, we've, we've probably all been there, right? I thought you were, yeah, okay. Older, younger, this, that. Oh, what we didn't mention, so you heard my previous background, I taught Russian history in my past. Well, my first husband many, many years ago was Russian, so I had a Russian last name for a while there, for a couple of years. Can you imagine, Sheree Gurnayev? <laughs> what do you think people think is gonna show up? Do I look Russian? Stereotypically, right? Probably not. Now, because I speak Russian, my friends who are Russian are people I meet who are from somewhere in the former Soviet Union do ask, so what part of Russia, Russia are you from? I'm like, oh, I'm American. What? Your Russian's pretty good. I go, yes, I know, but I'm not. So again, people can be fooled, I guess. So who are we? This particular group could check the same box. Now you will see some of the faces are repeated multiple times, but they all can check the same box on forms. So who are these group of people? What are they? What box would they check? U.S. citizen. Yes, they could check the U.S. citizen box, but it's another group. They're actually Hispanic from South Florida, but yes, we do actually talk about Latinx. Now, what's interesting is when I look at these pictures, I would perceive all these people to be, wow, they could be any race on there. I see some people who I perceive to be white, some people I would perceive to be indigenous or Asian or black or whatever, but they all happen to fall under this Hispanic category. Now, don't we use the terms Hispanic and Latino interchangeably as if they're one and the same? And that's how they're listed on forums too. It says, are you of Hispanic or Latino or Spanish origin? I think that's how that's listed on the form. So I met him on Bumble, and he was super nice, and we were texting all last night, and then he asked me how tall I was, and I told him, and then he stopped answering. All right, well, that's your first thing. You always have to update your profile, keep all your info in there, because One we... second, sorry. Bueno, hola, mami. No, no vi lo que pusiste en Facebook, ¿qué pasó? Mami, te puedo hablar al rato, estoy con un amigo. Okay, okay, love you, bye. Sorry, moms. I didn't know you were Spanish. I'm not. But you speak Spanish. But I wasn't born in Spain. Wait, what? I'm Hispanic. Oh, okay, I see, I see. Or should I say, yo veo. No. You've got to be kidding me. What's up? I asked the intern to make 100 copies of this casting call and there's a typo. Mmm, donde? I don't see a typo. Look, they put an X at the end of Latino. Latinx? Uh, it's Latin X. We should hire the intern. I didn't know there was a thing. Hey. Sorry I'm late. Oh, no problemo. I already got the tickets. Problema? What? Never mind, let's just get in line. Okay. So, who's in this movie? Well, we got Ryan Gosling and that Hispanic actress from Homeland. Moreno Bacarín? Yeah. She's Hispanic? Yeah, she's Brazilian American. Uh, so she speaks Portuguese. Well, what's your point? Uh, technically, if she's from Brazil, she's Latina, not Hispanic. Being Latina is based on geographic location, whereas being a Hispanic is focused more on language. Someone can also be both Latina and Hispanic. What would you call someone who's both Latino, Hispanic, and may or may not be a quarter Spanish? A, a person. person. Hi, my name is Laith Ashley. So what would you think based upon the name Laith? And if this person had to fill out forms, does this person again, gender-wise, identify as male? We're, yes, we're, I would think young. Young, yes. Okay, based upon the name. Because if you think of names that were, Laith probably doesn't fall into there, right? right? Excellent, thank you. A woman, okay. Thought male. Female, male, okay. What else? Yes somehow close to their origin, that maybe it's a name of another language, a, a, a name from another language. Okay, name from another language. So, Laith, what do we think Laith is? I'm Scandinavian. Scandinavian, okay. Great. All right, so now Laith <coughs> Ashley has to fill out those forms again, right? Whether it's an intake form to get our services, or we have a membership directory, and we want to kind of look at what our synagogue is looking like, whatever, right? How do you think Leith would fill out these forms? So this would be race, ethnicity, and gender. Again, with just the, it could be binary or not. White, okay, white. Oh, so white, non-Hispanic? White, non-Hispanic? Male, female, something else? Male, 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 okay. So, this is Leith. So, ideas changed. Still white, non-Hispanic, male? 
No, I see some shaking heads. So what do we think? Male, still male? Okay, not white? So if not white, what? Middle Eastern perhaps? Oh, now here's the interesting thing though. According to the definitions of white, white doesn't just mean people of European descent. It also means people from the Middle East and or North Africa. So then he'd be considered white if he was Middle Eastern because we don't yet have a category for Middle Eastern. So the flaws of our categories, by the way. I'm not approving the categories. I'm just saying it's putting a lot of people together. Laith is a real person also. Laith race-wise would identify as other. Hispanic, actually Puerto Rican and um, actually is a trans man. So sex identified at birth was female and transgender, female to male. So anyone remember the bathroom bill, HB2 North Carolina, right? Who gets to use the bathroom? So Laith would have to use the women's room. Think that would be a little awkward? Yeah. And by the way, who wants to be the bathroom police? You know, I don't want to sit here, you, no, nah, you over there, you, no, nah, I don't want to do that, you know? And that shows you kind of how silly this is, right? And yeah, things probably wouldn't go well if Laith went into the women's room. It may, because usually when I bring this picture up, I heard a couple of these, ooh, you know. <laughs> so, yes, that's what we always get. And that's if, you know, assuming heterosexual, being heterosexist there, you know. But what's interesting is actually Laith is um, a fashion model and walked New York Fashion Week back in 2016. So, again, showing how names, and like I would say, perceived to be male, but doesn't identify as male. Or... Being a trans man could at some point just say, hey, I identify as male, and you don't need to know that I was sex assigned at birth as female. What do you see first, young or old? I've seen this so many times when I look, I'm like, I can't help but eh, they're both at the same time. Now, question, is everyone who saw one, are you able to see the other? Okay, so let me, okay, let me use the laser pointer to show. So I'll start with the older woman first. So the older woman, okay, older woman, this is the hair. This is an eye, this is the nose, this is an eye, chin, smile, or excuse me, mouth, must be the jacket, and then probably, okay, I know everyone likes to call these like the babushka scarf, but it's not, a babushka is a grandmother, but one of those scarves that you would usually see that like the little Russian old lady wearing, right? Yes, one of those. Um, but then for the younger woman, we have a plume, some feather. We have her hair, side profile, so we have the eye, we have the outline of the side of the face and cheek, an ear, probably a necklace or a choker, also a coat, and either a kind of a scarf of some sort. So this is one of those, it's almost like those ink blot things that you would get and you come up with. The interesting thing is, so far more people saw the younger person, younger woman versus the older woman. Does that mean in our bias that we somehow a favor or value youth over age and experience or just doesn't mean anything. Let me give you one of, an example of, it could be nothing, right? Well, but you think historically in our society, age discrimination and hiring, how sometimes we treat our elders, etc. right? So here's one of my examples of bias that I uncovered accidentally. Um, so I was vacationing in Cancun a couple years ago with my kids. We climbed a lot of the Mayan ruins. We got to the top of one and this really nice older woman said, hey, and she spoke English too, even though I speak Spanish, but she said in English, would you like me to take a picture of your family? What should I have said? Yes, right? I did not, by the way. Thought she was nice, but I was like, oh no, I'm gonna ask this guy over here who happened to be younger. <laughs> and, and he took the picture, he wasn't all that nice about it, but he took the picture, we got a satisfactory picture. But be, maybe because I do this work and I told you I'm kind of hypersensitive to these issues, I'm literally walking down this ruin, try not to fall, by the way, but also like, Yikes, did I do that because I thought because she was older, she might be technologically challenged and I'd have to be, no, point the camera this way, do this, do that. And in hindsight, I'm like, I don't know. However, she was nice and she offered and I didn't have to ask. I probably, you know, now some people have said, oh, maybe you were afraid she'd steal your phone or camera. Not that, what, that didn't cross my mind at all. But I just jumped automatically to the younger person. But my professed belief would be, but I was raised to respect and value my elders, blah, blah, right? That did not come out in that moment. So that is an example of how unconscious bias actually works. So how about this? I mentioned the homeless earlier, right? This was an example. This could be anything. It could be a church. This happens to be a church. It could be a synagogue. It could be a mosque. It could be outside of a grocery store, anywhere. The story, though, with this is that this happened to be, I'll say, a Christian church. 
And what happened is, is on this Sunday, the new minister wanted to see how he would be received by his congregation. And he had, a couple of you have probably heard this, right. So he, had, he cut a deal with like the deacons in his church. So they didn't know. But he went in, dressed pretty shabbily, looked at what we would perceive to be homeless. Wasn't greeted very well. You know, people kind of gave him dirty looks. He went to sit down. No, 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 you can't sit there. Here, you need to sit in the back of the church. You, go to the balcony. Maybe you need to leave, right? So then the service is about to start and the deacons say, good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome our new minister, Reverend so-and-so. And the shabby, homeless looking guy walks down the middle of the aisle. There's actually like a little, I saw, I've seen the story, but I actually saw a depiction of this via video. And it's just, even though they're just acting, you can just see the responses on people's faces like, oh my gosh, Cindy, I think back to what you said in the beginning in your opening words and how this ties into this, right? How we shouldn't judge our fellow human being. And if someone is in need of assistance or help we're supposed to offer that regardless of who that person would be even if they are homeless and here we profess this but that is not how people acted in that particular moment so I just thought that was so poignant oh media oh my gosh so um, someone had mentioned stereotypes there are so oh my gosh I could almost take stuff weekly because there are so many different things things going on in the media right now this was from Hur Hurricane Katrina which was what, 2006, I think now? It's been almost 12 years. So how, you probably saw some variation of this. You know, people fighting for survival, trying to find food, clothing, drinks. So on the left, this young man, a young man walks through chest deep flood water after looting a grocery store in New Orleans versus two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store. <laughs> yeah. I'd almost, I'm not a betting person, but I'd say they probably were in the same convenience store, said hello on the way in, on the way out, same source, but one's looting, one's finding. Or maybe it just floated up to them in the water. I don't know, but, but I will tell you, who's more worthy of sympathy here? Oh, I feel so sorry for this family because they're fighting for survival, and he's a criminal because he stole, not looking at the circumstances. Or even down below, you actually do have a convenience store, like a 7-Eleven or something, you know, and as one person looks through their shopping bag left, Another jumps through a broken window. How is this perpetuating criminality and who's most likely to engage in criminal behavior? We've seen this frequently with the Palestinian propaganda media uh, where they'll show somebody who's supposed to have been murdered by Israeli soldiers and then another shot will show how people are gathered around and just hanging out or the corpse is breathing and uh, that the the shots are staged and we only see a certain portion of it. That's thanks to organizations like uh, Palestinian Media Watch and Camera. So an idea of how media can lie, right, or data can be misconstrued or used to tell you anything. There are so many instances of this. This recent bomber in Austin, Texas. Yes. The young white man and the stories coming out. Well, he can't. He, he was a troubled guy. Um, this is sympathy towards somebody who's done these horrendous things that would not have been offered. I think so, it, him if he was black or maybe other other so minorities. In this case, what it was saying is that yes, there is a sympathy that is offered. Like one slide I didn't happen to put in this presentation is how sometimes if there's a police-involved shooting, you know, we have a great picture of the police police officer who was engaged in the shooting and we have a really awful picture like let's dredge up the worst possible picture of the victim you know or I think back to several other instances remember that Stanford swimmer the rapist an ex Stanford swimmer or there was affluenza teen in Texas you know just the sympathy right you can use pictures to engage sympathy right for people versus other people and yes in the case of the Austin bomber people may not know a lot about the victims and so people are like, why do we always put the names out all the time? We're not saying you shouldn't say, share the name, but what about the people, the victims of this? The young man who was just, I think he had been admitted to Juilliard or Ober Oberlin. You know, the father, the this person, the, you know, we don't talk about that, you know. And so, yes. So now getting back to um, what she had said about media and how media can lie or misconstrue what's going on, and we can use data in the same way. Same data can be interpreted 10 different ways, is how many people see like cell phone video Video. And depending on the situation, you know, some people get sympathy. Like, okay, yeah, you know, oh, that per if they had just complied or this had happened or that hadn't happened, you know, or we, we don't know what the other part of the video shows us. Maybe this happened, maybe that happens, etc. And again, that empathy piece that I was talking about, even with the lady who had gone to the emergency room, sometimes due to our unconscious biases, that empathy can be lacking, especially for people we perceive to be outside of our own groups. 
in addition to that, this is um, very pertinent because some of you may remember Tamir Rice in Cleveland, and this probably happened with a young man out in Sacramento. Uh, last week. This is an American Psychological Association study. What it did is it looked at white boys and black boys and the perceived level of innocence, culpability for their crimes, their maturity, etc. Up until age 12, they were viewed to be the same. After that, all bets were off and black boys were viewed to be or perceived to be four and a half years older than they were. Tamir Rice in Cleveland was 12 was shot within seconds of the police arriving. He was on you know, a playground, had a toy gun. But he was 12 years old. But if this holds true, he wasn't viewed as a innocent 12-year-old boy, but rather a 16 and a half year old, 17-year-old man who's a threat and I feared for my life, so I shoot him down immediately. So that's how that can come into play. And also even language. I think back to what uh, Amy had said at the beginning, language matters. It's interesting looking at police blotters and reports. You know, If it's a young black male who's 17, he's described as a man. It's a 22-year-old, the swimmer. Oh, this youth, it was a youthful indiscretion. Language matters. Language, again, can imbue sympathy and empathy based upon what words we use. So if we thought it was bad for the black boys, black or African boys, it's even worse for girls. This came out last year, a day before I was doing a, a presentation, I had to put it in there. This is talking about, this is from the Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality, Girlhood Interrupted, and it's really sad. So some of you work with our youth, and we are here in Baltimore City. Trauma, all kinds of things. This was saying that as early as five years old, black girls are viewed to be hypersexualized, less in need of nurturing, more responsible for their actions. If we think of things such as disproportionate discipline in schools, suspensions, you name it, five years old, what grade are you usually in at age five? Kindergarten. kindergarten. So at five, you're hypersexualized in kindergarten? That is a problem, right? You're, you don't need nurturing? Oh my gosh, I think of kindergarten teachers, right? Huge nurturing role. So these have broad implications for our society and how people are perceived and treated and then later implications. And then that feeds into the school to prison pipeline. If you're a child of color, if you're a child with disabilities, if you're a child of low socioeconomic status, and those can be intersectional too. Like you could be a higher income black child, black girl, and still end up in that school to prison pipeline because of implicit bias and how you're punished. The same notion of disrespect, two kids say the exact same thing. One kid's being disrespectful, another kid, oh, boys will be boys. Who ends up in the system, who does not? This, so one reason why I talked about the names at the beginning, it's interesting how sometimes people will change their names so that they're more palpable to the broader society so that it won't hurt them in the end. So the Chicago resume study, and although this says hiring, think about how this can apply to other aspects of our lives. So the Chicago resume study sent out identical resumes. The names were uh, Lakeisha and Jamal versus Emily and Brennan. And what happened was is that those with the Emily and Brennan, the white sounding names, were much more likely to be called back than the Jamals and Lakeishas. Same qualifications, etc. The Canadian resume study, very similar, but what they found were that names that were Pakistani, Indian, and Chinese, so I'm not sure Mandarin or Cantonese, but Chinese perceived, were also less likely to be called back, despite identical qualifications. How many, have you, how many have been in some situation where that term, not a good fit, has been used? All of us, probably, right? Now, when you press people on what they mean by that, how well can people articulate what they mean by good fit? I almost feel like that's an, that's an aspect of unconscious bias, you know, because the person is not identical to who I am. I don't think they'd be a good fit for this organization. Applicant pool composition. So in this room, this wouldn't apply, but because we have very few people I would perceive to be men in this room. But what this says is that when there are fewer than 25% women in an applicant pool, women are less likely to be hired because the perception is, oh, there aren't enough, women aren't qualified for this position. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Social media biases. This is not people posting inappropriate pictures. <laughs> it's you put out what your religion is, your political affiliation. Oh my gosh, I see your pictures. You have kids? Oh, I don't want to hire someone with kids. Oh, you're gay or you're this or you're that. I can't ask you any of those questions during an interview, but boy, I can find that out on your LinkedIn page or your Facebook page or your Instagram, Twitter, take your pick of social media, and I can make assumptions. So it's like seeing someone who belongs to an LGBTQ organization. The assumption is, oh, that person must be on the spectrum. Maybe that person's just an ally. You don't know. Or we were just talking um, about we both, you know, I went to Howard University. She went to Hampton University. There's a funny thing about which one's the real HU. There are people, there are white people who go to historically black colleges or universities, but someone will look at a resume. Oh, this must be a black person because this person went to an HBCU. Again, we don't know, but that's what we use as shortcuts. 
Overweight and obese applicants. When I asked how we size people up, someone mentioned that. Yes, that can hurt you in a job search. Less likely to be hired, more likely to be fired, less likely to be promoted, and make less money. Then what they found is um, they've done secret stop shopper studies. If you even sit next to the overweight and obese person in the waiting room, you too salute, are less likely to be called back for an interview. What's interesting about this is it really only applies to women, salute, because think of the biases about women and our physical appearance. I think of it with newscasters. What happens when a, new, a woman, by the way, is a newscaster and after a certain age, oh, she's no longer physically or visually appealing to our audience, right? The guy's 80, <laughs> and he's still there, right? There was an example of this. There was a male newscaster last year or two years ago. He wore the exact same, right, exact same suit. You know, he must have had every single day for a year. No one commented. Female newscasters are out there. They will do a quick change during commercial break. Oh, my gosh, the audience doesn't like that orange. Or, who cares but the double standard that we use, right? Those with criminal records, not just felonies, felony disenfranchisement, oftentimes due to mass incarceration in this country, but if you have a felony, you can't vote, you cannot get Section 8 housing, you cannot get supplemental nutrition assistance, you cannot get Pell Grants, pretty much you can't do anything. It's like a scarlet letter that you must wear for the rest of your life. And then when you are unsuccessful and end up maybe back in prison, it's your fault, right? Even a misdemeanor can keep you from getting a job. So there have been some ban the box efforts. So social justice was something else that came up in Cindy's opening remarks. So this ban the box effort is to take in some states is to remove that box. Have you been convicted of have you been convicted of a felony or misdemeanor from the application so that that bias isn't used to keep you out of a job. So the goal is oh good maybe this person can get the foot in the door and then you know we can look on a case by case basis or this person's trying to start his or her life over. The problem with that is that there's other unconscious bias that comes into play. They've looked at subsequent studies in states or localities that have instituted that, and the assumption still is that black men are criminals or more likely to be criminals. And so if it's a black sounding name, and even if there's no question attached to it, I assume the black person's a criminal and I still don't call the black male back or the black person back. Those with poor credit histories. Many jobs require some sort of high level credit check, but what has been the number one reason for bankruptcy in our country for many years? Medical expenses, right? So you had a catastrophic injury or a life-threatening illness or you had to take care of a family member or spouse, but now you can't get a job because you've lost your home. You had to declare bankruptcy or your credit was run into the ground. Wow, that, does that mean you're less worthy? You probably need the job more than the next person, right? Those with accents, remember I mentioned accents, we tend to focus on foreign accents, but if you're someone with a heavy southern drawl or oh my gosh, I can tell that person's a New Yorker or a Boston person or this or that, right? And even though we all speak English, we may not always be communicating in English. So I mentioned I'm from Connecticut. Well, when I was in, I, I transferred into Howard, by the way. I went to UConn, go UConn, UConn Huskies, but um, especially the women. But um, when I moved to Washington, DC, here I'm speaking English, I thought we would communicate well, didn't work. So I asked, where, where can I find a package store? Because in Connecticut, you buy alcohol at the package store, right? I, 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 perfect English. Where is the package store? I was sent to, remember, mailboxes, etc. <laughs> I was looking for that kind of UPS package. I wanted the little package that you bring home in a package, you know? But we're speaking English. Or what is that thing, you go to Subway or Jimmy John's or Jersey Mike's or whatever, what is that thing that's on bread, you slap some meat on it, some cheese, some toppings, what do you call that? A hoagie, a hoagie right? Hero. Hero, sub. Grinder. Grinder, yes, grinder. That's what I asked for in DC. <laughs> that didn't go well. 14th Street, red light district. No, I wasn't looking for that. So, yes. I wanted a, something, a sandwich. Let me the ATMs in Wisconsin are called time machines. So you go anywhere else in the country and ask, where's the time machine? They think you're out of your mind. Yes. Oh, that's interesting. So see, you're speaking, excuse me, the same language, but it can be perceived very, very differently. Those with disabilities, and I talked to a couple people already. Remember, visible and invisible. I talked about the disabled parking space. So one thing I learned about is neurodiversity, especially those on the autism spectrum, how they are woefully underemployed because of bias against people with disabilities. And you know, on all these forms, on applications, you're supposed to disclose whether or not you have a disability. How many people actually feel comfortable doing so because yes it's supposed to be separate from your application but most people feel as if no this is going to be held against me if someone thinks they have to give me accommodations they're going to think I am less than etc 
And then lastly, those who are LGBTQI, and I gave you the acronym before, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer or questioning, and intersex. So basically, we really, in general, don't have federal laws that protect that umbrella community. A lot of it's state by state. Marriage equality, yes, but that's one aspect. As far as non-discrimination, a couple weeks ago, I believe a federal court said that sexual orientation was covered by non-discrimination laws, but gender identity is not. Even with our military, there's now, you know, this changes daily. Almost barely can speak to this one about can transgender individuals serve in our military? Yay, nay, yay, nay. I mean, it flip flops daily. So that basically means that they are not protected by non discrimination laws. And this is only a handful of ways that our biases can keep us not only from getting a job, but just interacting in our communities. So, microaggressions. So, these are people mean well. It's a question, a comment, even an intended compliment, but it can also suggest something demeaning. So, one would be think back to the original video, the opening one. Asking someone who's Asian American or someone perceived to be different from yourself, where are you from? That's implying the person's a foreigner in his or her own land. Telling a person of color that he or she is so articulate, which implies that all other people are not. So as a black woman, if someone tells me I'm a good presenter, cool, that's great. I hate that, oh, you are so articulate. Because I'm like, you know, I have never seen, you see this a lot with black male athletes, oh, he was just so articulate. But I've never seen a white male athlete described as articulate. Have you? You know, and it's like saying it's outside of the norm. And when I talk about counter stereotypical exemplars, it's like as if people are so shocked that that could be the case. Other things, oh, this one, I love, this is one of my favorite ones. This is really meant as a compliment. You're not like those other, insert whatever group we're talking about here, right? Because that implies that person is an exception, you know? Like, oh, you know, you're gay, and I, you know, I like you. You're my one gay friend, but I don't really like those other gay people, you know? But you're cool, you're cool, you know? And it's like, okay, that's why I always tell people when you want to basically have interactions with people of other groups, different groups, not just one, because that one person's not represent. no, one person's not representative of the group, and you need to feel more comfortable with more people than that. So with that in mind, um, this is a great video clip, and it's talking about how microaggressions are like mosquito bites, and it gives you great examples of all kinds of microaggressions across the spectrum. People who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem. Oh, you're so well-spoken. Oh. Just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while... No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland? Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date... Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you gonna have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the Redskins name. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. <gasps> I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? Can you give me shopping so advice? Bad I love Cher too! And getting bit by mosquitoes every day. Can I? Touch your hair multiple times a day. So pretty. Can, can I, I touch, touch your it? Hair? Please. Can I please? Can I please? Annoying. That makes you want to go ballistic on those mosquitoes, which seems like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. It's just a mosquito bite. Who cares? Just another angry black woman. Of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm. Maybe you should try less challenging, major. Ow, my dreams. And other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. You looked like you was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic, wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggressions. So I think that's a, because it's talking across the spectrum. And that's not to say, by the way, that white men cannot experience microaggressions either. We've all either experienced them or committed them or observed them. And there are just so many other examples we could use. But very quickly, I wanted to show you an example, a couple of examples. On the left would be someone I would perceive to be white, perhaps. And someone on the right is some person of color. And see how language matters and is used differently. So on the top, I know you can't see these, so I'm going to read them to you. Um, these are two young people, and the people are holding babies. Uh, is that your little brother versus, uh, is that your son? What's the assumption? Teen parent? Next one, um, this is, could be the PE teacher, the coach. What colleges have you applied to? Versus, will you be the first person in your family to graduate high school? 
well-meaning, right? In, the, um, in college, what's your major? Versus, are you the first person in your family to go to college? In the workplace, do you have any kids? Versus, how many kids do you have? And we could probably throw in there, oh, and do they all have the same father? Which is one, heterosexist. Two, there might not be a father. And also, why does the person who is a woman have to have kids in the first place? What if you're someone who suffers from infertility? You know, I mean, I think about that every Mother's Day. You know, it's like that's a very difficult time for a lot of women. And we just, when are you having kids? You know, that kind of thing. Or someone who's had a miscarriage or infant loss or child loss. And then the last one's actually a medical setting. Both women are wearing wedding bands. The healthcare provider says, what does your husband do? Versus is the father still in the picture and is grimacing. So again, can be heterosexist. There might not be a father. It could be two moms. It could be a grandparent. Again, people would say, oh, no big deal. Language doesn't matter. But those are all hurtful situations. So what are micro assaults? So this is actually an intentional thing. So things such as, and I'm not going to say any of these slurs, by the way, but disability-related, racial, ethnic, sexist, religious, or homophobic epithets. And you could probably add a lot more onto those. Displaying any kind of, whether it's swastikas, Confederate flags, anything that's used to intimidate and strike fear in people. It could be shopkeeper vigilance, or shopper profiling, or stop and frisk policies disproportionately used in certain communities versus others. Micro insults, again, this is something intentional. Verbal and nonverbal communications, and they convey rudeness and insensitivity, and they can demean a person's heritage or identity. So many examples of this in many different settings. So asking, an asking a colleague of color how they happen to get the job, or how are you an athlete, or whatever, implying the person's the affirmative action hire. Assuming a professional person of color is the hired help, such as the custodian, the secretary, bellhop, valet. In the video, I never would have guessed you were gay, and I heard lots of laughter, like, oh, do you know John? Can you give me shopping advice? I like Cher, too. You know, every single stereotype you can think of, right? And there are so many different instances of these. And like I said, even diversity and inclusion people mess up. One of my colleagues who's a chief diversity officer at a big organization that I will not name, black male, saw another black male colleague who was very tall, and he knew the guy had played sports in college. So he asked, hey, were you a basketball player? <laughs> the guy was a swimmer. Counter, you know, again, thinking of counter stereotypical examples. And then this one, I was kind of talking about at the beginning when I talked about the ground rules, just because you haven't experienced something and then telling, basically denying or negating someone else's experience. This is where someone raises something that's happened to them, right? But you're playing the race card or the gender card or the gay card or the Jewish card or the this whatever card, right? Because you haven't personally experienced it. You're just being too sensitive. That person meant well. So one thing we talk about, it's not intent, it's impact. I might have meant well when I said you're not like those other whatever. But the impact of that is like, what do you mean I'm not like the other such? What are you talking about? And then all these stereotypes spill out. Black lives matter. What about all lives? All lives matter. Yes, in principle, all lives should matter, but we're focusing on certain lives right now because disproportionately things aren't going so hot for certain lives. Or hashtag me too, dealing with sexual harassment and assault. And I just wanted to give a shout out to the social activist Tarana Burke because I know when this came out last fall, I guess it was, everyone was attributing it to Alyssa Milano, the actress, but Tarana Burke actually started that, what well, wasn't hashtag, but the Me Too movement in 2006. She's actually speaking later in April. There's a Women of the World Festival in Baltimore at Notre Dame University of Maryland, and she's one of the opening speakers if anyone's interested in going to see her speak. And the last thing is about language. What's the big deal? They're only words. You know, I talked about neurodiversity, so I'll hear people say, that's retarded. That's so gay. There are so many different, and because of the work I do, I feel empowered to speak up, and I hope that eventually, as we hear people saying inappropriate things, we too will feel empowered. Recognizing, though, there are power differentials. If it's your boss, that's kind of difficult to do. And sometimes those of us who are in power have to speak up for people who are unable to do so. So how can we mitigate? So I want to practice in our last 15, 20 minutes here. How can we mitigate implicit bias in everyday life? So some of you took, I hope, some of the implicit association tests. I'm interested to hear what you thought about that. Not your results, by the way, please. I don't need to know that. But remember the researchers I mentioned at the beginning, Mazarin Banaji and Anthony Greenwald, they came up with these initial tests. So what they were trying to do is using your two fingers. I think now you can do it on phones and devices. It used to be only on a computer keyboard. They're trying to show where your conscious and unconscious minds don't match or diverge. So this is, uh, again, those researchers, UVA, U of Washington, Harvard. And basically, they were saying that our thoughts and our feelings exist outside of our conscious awareness, and they are outside of our conscious control. 
But this goal, the goal of the project though is for self-education and self-awareness, not, all right, we're hiring candidates or we're seeking out candidates and everyone has to do this IAT because we're working with this community. So depending on how you score on the IAT, yay or nay. Absolutely not, because like I said, I'm not sharing my results. <laughs> I don't need to hear anyone's results, and the goal is not to make you feel guilty. Recognizing this tool is not 100%, but right now it's one of the better tools we have just to make people aware. This started initially with the race implicit association test, black, white, and they've gone into all kinds of different things, gay, straight, religion, gender and career, gender and science, Asian, disability, weight, age, skin tone, oh my gosh, light skin versus dark skin, Weapons, you know, can you tell what is an actual weapon versus a cell phone or nothing at all? And then what I think is really important, especially for the work we do, are perceptions of mental health. Is mental health a personal failing? What, what, do we, what is it, someone who has an eating disorder versus depression or anxiety? And how do we fare there? Because that can really impact, if I'm working with elders, for example, Jessica, like we were talking about, if I'm working with elders and this is an elder who has depression and I have negative views towards people with depression, oh my goodness, how is that implicit bias gonna affect how I actually serve that particular client? Please, again, do not share your individual results. Would anyone, a few people like to share what tests you actually completed? So I did, I did the one where um, you were shown pictures of people and determined whether they were good looking or not good looking. And they compared that with good words and bad words. And as someone who has a master's degree in management, the instrument seemed not to match what they were trying to determine. So the, the instrument or the survey, you, you uh, were given a group of good-looking people and a group of not so good-looking people, a group of good words and a group of bad words. And you had to go through and match, you know, and, and uh, put in a letter for is, are you looking at a picture of a good looking person or a good word or a bad word and a not so good looking person? And they switch that up to try and determine some type of bias, which I did not at all think was valid in, in the method of the instrument. Which one was that that you actually took? Was that the race black white? Was it another one? It was another one. Um, okay. Uh, I can't. wasn't weight or I'm just trying to think because I will say speaking from the race one black whites the original one they started with and having taken that one what they do start off with is can you identify what is a person who would be perceived as black versus someone who's perceived as white and then you initially then have to good is supposed to be associated with white and now we switch it up to see how quickly can you match good with a black face because remember I gave you just one example of media stereotypes it's very sometimes it's it's more difficult sometimes to match good with a black or a brown face. And so that's where the methodology was at and that they apply to other things. Also, remember when I asked how quickly do we have to size people up seven seconds? Well, even on this um, tool, you don't have seven seconds. No one's sitting back for 10 minutes looking at someone like, well, let me see, is that person gonna be a good fit or not? We make snap decisions, right? And that's what they're hoping you can do with two fingers very quickly. So that's what the methodology is at. And actually, you might be interested, they have a book for lay people about the methodology and all the different tests and such that I'll get to a little bit later. Or even, you know, there are actually some YouTube videos, maybe Cindy, I'll send you one or two about the methodology in lay person's terms on YouTube, like five minutes that explain what they were trying to get at. I thought it was interesting because um, I think I took one test that was, um, it was race and weapon, weapons associated. And with, um, it was like a neutral, like a, a white face, white person's face and a black person's face, and they're very neutral. Um, and so I, I totally could see like, it's just looking at the words and the, the face, but I had an issue when I came to um, the test on disability, because I'm a, a professional, I'm a professional who works in the disability field. And they, instead of actual, like, instead of neutral pictures, the pictures that were representing disability were not neutral. They were, had a negative connotation. So it was um, the people with the, the ability pictures were people, like, it, they were signs, like road signs or like images. And it was like people walking together or a person skiing. And then it was a picture of crutches without even a person in. It was crutches or a person walking with, like, it was just, 
the pictures were not neutral, where in the race it was neutral pictures. So I had a problem with that, and I was curious how old these are, how often they're updated, things like that. So they have, like I said, they started originally with the race, the black, white, and they add different tests as they go along. And see, part of it with being neutral, not neutral, again, when you think, of, not, not you particular, but when sometimes when people think of crutches, they jump to the negative. And so I remember, right, right, right But right. if it was a picture of someone with, like a neutral picture of someone who's standing compared to someone who uses a wheelchair, but they're like neutral pictures, it's like, when the person's not even in the picture, but you're kind of judging a person, it's, right. yeah. But see, that becomes, again, I'm not speaking for the researchers here, but again, when they're trying to indicate where we might have sure. biases, if I asked, like say if we had an exercise, think of someone with a disability. So someone might say someone in a wheelchair, someone might say someone with crutches, someone might say someone with mental health issues, someone, you know, right. and so, but what happens is, we oftentimes automatically jump to a negative, even though that's only one aspect of who that person is. So I think that's what they're trying to get at. And what happens is too, is I was gonna ask anyone, is were you surprised by your results? Because remember what I said <laughs> about how we can, you know, I gave you the example, the one example about, you know, oh my gosh, I was raised to believe and these are my declared beliefs, but this is not how I behaved. You know, I, when I take these tests, I don't tend to get defensive. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that about myself, you know, versus, oh, there must be something wrong with the methodology or maybe I wasn't quick enough or maybe, you know what I mean? Does right. that make, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, especially when we get results we're not expected. To your question about being surprised by results, I was actually surprised by the results on one of mine. I did the uh, test on race and the weapons and as a person who almost 40 years ago was a Southern cop, and what I was taught in the police academy and we were trained to profile and the experiences on the street, I really expected the results to be very different than they were. I think results came out that there was not a bias when I really expected myself to have that implicit bias based upon that training. So I was really, it, it almost made me question the validity of the test and then I decided to just think better of myself instead. Uh, but it was. Or had think if this had been available 40 years ago and you had taken it then when that was right. what your vantage point was you might have scored very differently but right. you've now had 40 years to kind of try to somehow undo without knowing what you were taught in that profiling well so that's another what you know what I'm saying that's another mm -hmm. way to interpret it so but to give you an example when people are amazed by the results or shocked by the results so women who are scientists there's that gender in science women who are scientists come out and like oh my gosh what I'm not supportive of women in science because yes we say all we want we want more girls than women in STEM but you know even in early grades no girls you get diverted out of science and math and you go here and then we wait till college and you think of women's experiences in grad school in the sciences and engineering and technology it doesn't match what we're saying so do you see how that can happen? Yes. I took the test that was uh, men and women associated with words for power or weakness, uh, assuming uh, whether a man or a woman would be a good boss. And what surprised me about it were the, the actual words used, like powerful and over my my career, um, my assumptions about who makes a good boss have have changed from those adjectives. I took the uh, <clears throat> the two tests, one on race and the one with weapons, and I can remember as I was taking it, trying not to um, put on it what I thought were my biases or, or what I was taught, but the the outcome was, in fact that the implicitness of what I thought even about blacks or about whites still came through the, even though I tried not to. You know, it's, you know what they're asking, right? Oh my gosh, I don't want to appear X or Y, so you try to overcome that, but it's very, very difficult to do. So, excellent, thank you everyone for sharing. I mean, these are fun exercises to do, but like I said, they're really just for personal awareness. This was an example of what you were talking about, Reverend, is that it's according to the, like at this point, there was like 1.2 million tests that had been completed. They found that 70% of people black and white had some sort of automatic preference for white people because of stereotypes, learned stereotypes, what we're exposed to, et cetera. 
But like I said, the warning is don't use this for any other purpose than self-education or self-awareness. So here are our practical tips. One is don't feel guilty. Easier said than done. I too even feel guilty when I find out that I messed up. Remember my example I gave you. To reverence point, one of my examples I'll share, last one, and we'll wrap up, is that I, I used to be politically active. So I was out on election day a couple years ago knocking on doors in a neighborhood. Ma'am, sir, have you voted today? A young black male said to me, oh no, I can't vote. So what did I, as a fellow black person, think about this young black male? Why couldn't he vote? He was a felon, right? So I like to talk, obviously, right? So I asked him, so why can't you vote? Turns out he had immigrated from Jamaica eight years prior and wasn't a US citizen. This says not to feel guilty. I am not going to lie. I felt awful, awful, walking away like I had some albatross, like what, how did? But this goes back to what you were saying, Reverend. You're trying not to, but I'm programmed in the same way as what our society tells us. But then what happens is guilt becomes inaction, and that is not where we want people to be. Debiasing techniques, training, not just one and done, what you're continuing to do. So again, I commend Cindy and the work that you're doing here. Intergroup contact, but like I said, not just one, because that's where we exceptionalize the one person from that group. And there are great ways to do this. Breaking bread, holidays, book groups, worship, you name it. How many people have the opportunity to be in a group where you are, I hate to use the term minority, majority, because they're changing, but where you are the only person out of the broader group? <laughs> Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. And then that gives you the idea of what it might feel for other marginalized groups sometimes to be the only or a few in a group. Taking the perspective of others, I've talked a lot about empathy. Emotional expression, nonverbal body language, and Amy, you had mentioned this. I could say something in a very nice voice or nice words, but my body language is very negative. So like if I'm saying something to you, like I really, I really like that, I really like that, I really like your necklace. <laughs> Wow, that, my body language is such, it's like I'm glaring at you, my arms are crossed, I'm not open, what, the, you know, are you gonna believe me? You know, that's not, that's creating a barrier, right? Um, and it, the, uh, you've heard me say throughout, count your stereotypical examples, trying to think, and when you jump to, like in my case, when I thought of this young black male as a felon, you know, I could think of my dad, my dad who's still working at 71 is an engineer, you know, and not that someone's an exception, but something that's different from what the stereotype is telling me, because it's extremely important. When you see that name that, oh my God, that name sounds too ethnic, you know, think of something else, take a mindful pause. I'll skip that, but for further reading, so this was the, uh, David, I believe, this is the book I was talking about, and I've got to say something, though, about the term blind spots, and it was Sarah, I'm trying to read your, Sarah. Um, the interesting thing is, it's yes, the name, these are the two research I, I'm, researchers I mentioned. So it's blind spot, hidden biases of good people. However, the use of the term blind spot is considered an ableist term. It was brought to my attention last year. A lot of my presentations used to say, unconscious bias, uncovering our blind spots. I am not an expert in the disability community, right? Someone reached out to me before the webinar and said, hey, do you realize this? And I changed the title of the webinar, mentioned this during the webinar, and people appreciated it because I was being humble and admitting that I had made a mistake. So that's one of the books. This is that Science of Implicit Bias review I talked about that comes out every year since 2013. If you're in healthcare or working with different populations in the medical field, seeing patients, and then also everyday bias. Other things, love has no labels. If you've seen John Cena walking down the street in a commercial looking in shop windows, that's this PSA, love has no labels. They even have, you might have seen the PSA, the x-ray machine outdoors and people, you see skeletons and then it's people and it's a disabled person and this and you know, getting us to change our minds. Tips to fight bias and pre prejudice. I would highly recommend this as well as the Southern Poverty Law Center speak up responding to everyday bigotry because it has all these different scenarios that have happened to real people. And as you read them, like, oh, this happened to me. Because what oftentimes happens, I will skip that, but you'll have access to it. It's what not to do. It's the, I don't see color. I don't see age. I don't see gender, which is not true. But some people like to say that thinking they're good people, well-intentioned. So just to give you an example, what happens is we're often in these situations where we have someone who routinely makes anti-Semitic comments about us uses the N-word in casual conversation, teases someone about their last name, implying they're in a certain group, or insults people, right? But what happens is, most of the time, we cannot respond on the fly. And you leave, and you think later, oh, I should have said something. Or your silence. What have you heard that silence is complicity? If you don't say anything, people assume you agree. What I had wanted to practice with, but I would think this is a great exercise when you go back to your own communities, is discussing examples, other examples, and there are numerous ones of bi bigotry and bias either you have observed Experience, observed, and or committed. And then the situation would have been, did you respond? If so, how? Maybe you didn't respond. 
How could you have responded? Did others respond on your behalf? Because remember when I mentioned power differential? If it's not a one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes it behooves people who are not in that group being disparaged or whatever to speak up because it's much more powerful sometimes. We were gonna discuss a few of those examples. This was the social experiment I mentioned at the beginning. Can I close with putting it all together? Just for you to think about as you're leaving, think about what you learned in today's workshop. And as you go back to whatever community you're in, agency, even your own self, discuss something actionable you can bring back to your family, youth work, elder care, community building, and fundraising. So with that, thank you.